Uh, but Khalil, uh, obviously, it has been for you uh, just a really roller coaster year. I mean, to put it mildly, right? Even without fighting, you know, supposed to fight Jamal Hill in June, that gets scrapped. You you uh, you self report accidentally taking a banned substance containing anabolic steroid. You're commended for it up for being up front. Uh, and at the end of the tunnel, here you are fighting Alex Pereira, October 5th for the light heavyweight title. Just how you drew it up, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't even written that story myself. What, what a crazy, uh, you know, mixture of events, but yes, here we are, um, in the midst of all the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> what what has what have all these emotional highs and lows felt like for you? Uh pretty much like how you explained it in the beginning, a roller coaster. Um, you know, there the the incline was the moment that uh you know I was preparing for UFC 307. And that first drop was a drop that wasn't necessarily excitement. I felt like my gut drop and I thought the lowest that I'd been in a really long time, just devastated. Um and then uh, you know, some some twists and turns to get through you know, all the information and stuff to the UFC, anti-doping, uh, you know, Nevada State Athletic Commission, just showing out everybody proof facts. This is the situation. Um, and, you know, just writing it out until they all, yeah, getting the call for this fight was totally Which, unexpected, I, but I was happy, excited, grateful. Yeah. Of course, of course, all those things. But, but really, I mean, when you look at it, it's not just this year for your whole career has been kind of a wild ride, you know, coming out of the Ultimate Fighter 4-0, only a pro for two years. You lose your first two, coming, you know, including the uh, the tough final. Only four wins in your first ten for the UFC, and that came after your your coach John Wood said he talked to you out of quitting to yeah. go into construction. You know, it's, it's crazy. You, you've had this this wild uh, uh, career trajectory. Take me back to before this streak that you put together, five wins in a row. What are you thinking in terms of career trajectory? At Ooh, this point? I mean, are we going back? Or are we talking now? <laughs> I think, uh, uh, well, now obviously things difference... are looking pretty good, but 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 let's say you know the difference for when you're coming out of that two fight losing streak, and and then you go finally you do go on that run right before you go on that run. Where are you at? Uh, I mean, man, I think that you know getting into the UFC the way that I did, like you said, professional for two years, only four fights, going to the Ultimate Fighter, and then straight into the big show. Um, I mean, the way that I look at it now is like I was still a baby, <laughs> is what it seems like, you know, based off of what I've gone through now. Um, you know, the amount of work that I put in now on a daily basis versus how I used to train and work back then. Uh, they're just, they're worlds apart. And um, I think now over the past, I'd say three years after coming back from Thailand is when I really made the decision that if I'm in this, the then I'm going for the highest level versus before I was just happy to be a UFC fighter. And I think it made a huge difference in that shift. And obviously the, the results speak for themselves. I mean, you you got four TKOs out of the next five wins. Pereira, of course, you know, he he's he's a knockout artist himself. There's kind of this broad expectation you two are going to produce fireworks no matter who wins. You know, what what are the chances that we're all wrong though? And this becomes one of those kind of clinch grapple wars that between strikers that we occasionally see. Um wow, I'd say just to call it even, it's 50-50. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think from my end, I've said it before. I mean, I want to go out there and give the fans what they expect to see from me. And I don't think that fans really expect to see me wrestle. So it's, you know, um, I, I want to do this in the, the most exciting way possible. I want to give the fans the most exciting fight. Um, and who knows, who knows where it goes. But I, I what I can say with confidence is that you know, whatever happens and whatever fight um, this turns out to be, it's going to be highly entertaining. Now, as we speak, you are the number eight light heavyweight contender in the UFC zone rankings behind four men who have not faced Pereira, two of which have not competed for UFC gold like yourself. You know, you're an unorthodox challenger in that respect. When this year started coming off of that fifth win, in December against Anthony Smith, how many fights did you believe you needed to get to this opportunity? 
Um, somewhere around one or two. I think after beating Anthony Smith, I thought like, I thought, okay, the, you know, booking me for UFC 307, I thought like, okay, if I go out there and, and really do my best and put on a good performance and, and, and get a good win, um, you know, then maybe my next shot could be what I've been asking for. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't think I was too far away. I thought, you know, one, one or two for sure. No more than two. Okay. Okay. And obviously there was that fight that did end up getting booked later on. It was going to be you and Jamal Hill. That yeah. pretty clearly would have vaulted you anyway. So there was that one fight. But at the beginning of the year is what we're talking about, of course. Now, yeah. you have earned a reputation as kind of this kickboxer killer, right? You know, you knocked out former K1 champ Gokansaki in the octagon. You stopped Carl Roberson, who once spoiled uh, the great Jerome LeBanner's retirement fight. You got that decision against former Glory title challenger Dustin Jacoby. Now here's Pereira, former two-time, two-division Glory champion. How do you keep lining up with these kickboxers? What's the deal here? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, they just so happen to be on the roster. Um, and I think, you know, I'm I'm here to fight whoever, you know, whoever the UFC gives me, and especially – after breaking in the top 15, I was focused on fighting whoever was in front of me. Um, and it just, you know, um, it just so happened, you know, that these are the guys. Um, but to go back to what you said, I mean, I'm, I'm confident and comfortable stepping in there with guys who have kickboxing experience. And again, it's better for the fans. Is there anything to kind of just the way that, kickboxers fight that maybe when they come over to the octagon that maybe you just kind of i don't know vibe with in a sense that your style kind of can work a little better do you see or is it is this really just like one result and another result and another result i think it's just like the latter um mm -hmm. you know i think that it's fighting these kickboxers i guess just gives me another you know opportunity to you know showcase striking um yeah, there may be a little bit of grappling, a little bit of clinching, but it doesn't necessarily seem like it's too much of like ground fights, you know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm here for it. Yeah. Sure, sure. Now again, Hill, uh, you know, your almost opponent, he recently said uh, that the fact that you're a southpaw should work in your favor in this fight because, in his words, you know, the the fight it's fighters from that stance that Pereira has. Struggled against a kickboxing. It was also against Bruno Silva in the UFC before he ended up becoming the champion at middleweight. To what degree do you agree or disagree with Hill? I I'm no coach. Um, I I can't say that it's going to make any difference. I think that we're all professional, and I think they like if the if someone like him realizes it then they probably do too and they're probably doing things to you know to balance that out so i don't look at you know at the easy way out or you know like you know these little things um cool you know if it's true it's true if it's not it's not um but you know my my strategy is to just be my absolute best you know like that that's the number one thing sure sure and you know when we see you in the cage you're you're known to throw some, you know, not necessarily always unorthodox, but let's say uncommon strikes in the cage. You obviously you stopped Modestus Bukaskis with that gnarly uh, oblique kick. You're you're practically hammer fisting Chris Dawkins's hand. I mean, you guys are at distance. This is, this is things we don't normally kind of say. Like it's not even slapping. You're like hitting it, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, where, where does kind of the fact that you'll do these things that we don't normally see put in practice in fights come from? Um. I think the fact that I'm a mixed martial artist <laughs> and that's it itself. I think that the things that I do or that I implement into my, um, you know, into my toolbox, they come from other martial arts and our job as mixed martial artists are to mix. So, and artist, I think that that's a part that is also kind of lost in, in today's, you know, times and, you know, I think there, I don't really see many artists in this, in, in this game anymore. We don't have the Leota Machitas, the Anderson Silvas, you know, the, 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 I don't see them as much as I did in the past. And so I think that's, I guess, a way of me trying to, you know, bring a little art to the, uh, to the sport. Is your opponent one of those artists, would you say? 
Uh, in different ways. Um, in different ways. I believe that like I I see I see strategy. I see things that are pretty pretty creative, um, pretty artistic, and when mixed together, they can um, create good results for him. So it's exciting. <laughs> it's exciting. Sure, sure. Now you go by your full name, Khalil Roundtree Jr. For those yeah. who don't know, your father had been Boys to Men's tour manager uh, when he was murdered in a Chicago hotel in 1992. You were just two years old. This is a subject you've opened up before about before, but yeah. you're on the doorstep here of reaching the peak of your field. How much does it mean for you and your family to keep your father's name alive through you and and the chance to bring new glory to that name? Hmm. It's it's so cool. It's so important. I mean, I think for me, it's everything that I've worked for, really. Um, I mean, I like not knowing my dad growing up, um, but knowing what ha what happened to him. I always just wanted to or not always, but there became a time and especially when I started fighting that I wanted to honor him, you know, and and, and make something um, out of myself so that, you know, I can imagine him looking down and, and being proud, you know, like, wow, my son was this, like this kid that had no courage and who locked himself inside of his room to like, wow, now this guy's fighting lions in the cage, you know, for a world championship. So um, it's, it's, it's really big. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm so excited for this moment and just to be able to be in this, in this, uh, in this situation to, yeah, to, to bring, you know, more honor and more light uh, to the work that my father did and also the work that I've put in. And, you know, you did not get to know him, as you mentioned, but, you know, when when people tell stories about your father, what what's the kind of the through line? What was he like as a man? I hear only good things. I mean, the the stories that I hear, they're, they're always around the lines of like, oh, your dad, you know, he was there for me and this, this was like the toughest time or he helped, you know, he helped my kids or, you know, it was just always involved with people and he was always a support to people, um, a good teacher. And what, what really stands out the most is that everybody who tells me stories about my father, they're always meaningful stories. They're always stories that like they hold on to and they're like, I'll never forget this. And I'll always appreciate him for, for that, you know? And growing up as a kid, it's like kind of hearing those things. I'm like, wow, like this guy sounds great. Uh, so yeah, I hear nothing, nothing but good things. And so um, I feel like it's it's just my job, my duty as his son to, uh, you know, follow that and, and try to pass that down. And, and, and like I said, you know, he was working with Boys to Men. They were huge, at, yeah. at, even at the time. But then they even they they had staying power in the '90s. You know, they they of course they titled uh, an interlude on their best selling album, Khalil, an ode uh, to your father. Did yes. you did you guys stay in touch? You and the family stay in touch with the band or the the group over the years? Or yeah, there were. I mean, it slowly faded away, but then like it started to come back and when they found out that I was fighting and things, they were so excited. And, you know, we, we exchanged little words here and there. Um, anytime they play shows, they've said that I'm always welcome to come out. And um, yeah, so it's not a, a very like, you know, thick relationship, but um, it, the, you know, the, the lines and the respect are still there for sure. Sure. And, and the last thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, you really might be one of the most emotionally open or available fighters uh, that we've seen. You know, you, you're very OK. You seem very OK, at least putting your kind of whole art on display when you speak to reporters like myself. Uh, when when you we see more fighters in recent years kind of doing that, Dustin Poirier, uh, Alex Volkanovsky, even Sean Strickland, who's, you know, not really a fan of yours. And he's obviously said some kind of nasty things about you for doing so. We've seen him put his put himself on display as well. Why is it that you in particular are so comfortable speaking about some, you know, very emotional topics like mental health? And why do you believe that that's right for you or maybe for anyone? Um, I really think that it's because I'm... I'm I'm so like grateful to be the in the position that I'm in. I'm a fighter, you know, people want to interview me, people want to speak and so I just want to be myself. You know, I like that's that's the number one thing. I 
it, it's cool to be able to speak to you and you're going to write something and other people are going to read it. And so I'd, I'd like, if I have this opportunity to talk and say who I am, then I want it to be real. You know, I want you know, I want, I want it to be felt. And that's, you know, that's why I just choose to, to just be myself. I, I can't really help, but to do that and, and to operate that way. You know, if I, I, I couldn't, I don't think that I could try to fake like a persona if I like wanted to. Um, but here's the thing too. It's like, as I think it's a cool balance to have because yeah, as open as I can be, uh, to reporters and journalists i mean then i go in the cage and display something completely different and that's just really showing the world that like who i am you can see both sides you know you can see both sides